Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Vietnamese German universities, we commit to excellence in research and teaching in the fields of engineering as well as economics and management. As a highly acknowledged research university with a distinctive profile, VTU could contribute to the economics and social development of Vietnam. And to learn more how VTUs hold up to our vision, missions and goals, please welcome Professor Thomas Benz for his sharing on the topics VTU governance, development and implementations. Please welcome Professor Benz. Thank you very much. We already heard about the strategic uh, the, uh, plans, the, the master plan the, uh, of VGU. We heard a bit about the development, we heard about the, the support and uh, the, the point of view from World Bank. Now I would talk to you about the University Charter, University Council, other university bod bodies. But why? You see, in, from the German point of view, these bodies, this kind of participation uh, in, the, in the decision making of a university is a very important contribution to the general development, to the support, and last but not least, to the scientific outcome and the teaching outcome of a university to have this as unified as possible. This is not working. Can you help me? Or can you just forward to the next slide? Okay, let me give you a short overview about the development of the government. So, as we already heard in, in uh, 2008, we had the establishment of the Vietnamese German University. In 2009, we had our first charter, so the first try to give a general set of rules for the university, of the governance of the university, and the, 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 the strategic mindset. In 2010, we had the first meeting of, uh, uh, of the uh, University Council, signing of the financing agreement between Vietnam and World Bank for the new model uh, university project. In 2017, we had this, the second charter. So in this time, in these seven years, we had quite a good development from the legal point of view, from the legal framework in Vietnam already with the new higher education law in 2012. But there were a lot of ex uh, experience has been made on the development of WeGU, where the partners, so the two German ministries, and the Vietnamese Ministry of Education and Training, and the Vietnamese Ministry of Education and Training agreed that the VGU needs a different, um, a different general framework for um, for its uh, for its working. Then, in uh, 2019, so last year, we implemented the first inner bodies, decision-making bodies. Um, as you heard in the welcome speech already from, um, from uh, Vice Minister Fook, we had the election of the Academic Senate, so this is the highest inner decision-making body, and the election of the first faculty, councils, uh, uh, faculty council of VGU. And this year, our biggest success point uh, from the legal side was the signing of the Tea Party ag Agreement between the Minis Vietnamese Ministry of Education and Training, the Hessen Ministry of Science and Arts, and the Federal Ministry of Education and Research um, in last month, one month ago. This gives us the legal basis to now develop the third um, university charter next year, a new special financial regime, a new special financial re uh, regulation, 
that allows us or gives us a much higher um, uh, level of financial autonomy and financial autonomy in this case does not mean that we will be independent from the financial sourcing from the Vietnamese government but that we will be allowed as a university to define what we are paying, how we are paying in terms of investing, in terms of salaries and in terms of other running costs. And uh, we will have implemented uh, in the coming year a steering committee. This is a, a, um, a body above the University Council to, uh, or a level, a platform to communicate between the three uh, involved ministries to discuss all issues uh, when it comes to finance the, the university. Um, let me give you a, a short overview about the structure of, of the university. So we have above the, the, um, uh, the university bodies, we have the three ministries, the Ministry of Education and Training, uh, the Hessen Ministry of uh, Arts and Science, and the Federal Ministry uh, of Education and Research. We will implement next year the steering committee. What we have so far is the University Council uh, above all inner bodies of the university and then within the university we have as any other university in Vietnam a presidential board and the uh, administrative departments but what we have and there is I think some might be some misunderstanding when it comes to translation to Vietnamese uh, the Senate and the University Council in Vietnamese is sometimes mixed up so we have both institutions and the Senate is um, uh, um, a body with uh, members, I will explain this in detail later, only with members from inside the university and then the faculty council. Um, our university charter in general, not about the specific things, it defines the mission of the university and it defines the roles and responsibilities of the inner uh, bodies of the university, like the University Council, Presidential Board, Senate, and Faculty Council. The specific definition of the university autonomy is uh, described within, uh, it fixed in this, um, in this uh, charter, um, describes the level of uh, autonomy within and beyond the legal framework for higher education in Vietnam. The steering com uh, committee, as I already mentioned, represent with the representatives of the three involved ministries. They should meet at least once a year, uh, more often if there, has, uh, if there are some issues to be solved when it comes to uh, financing, to budgets, um, to the support, financial support of the university. The tasks, the long-term financial planning and to solve or discuss some strategic questions for the university and to give advice to the University Council and to the Presidential Board. The University Council itself uh, consists of two, 10 Vietnamese members and 10 German members. That's a unique situation as well for a Vietnamese public university. Uh, the Ministry of Education and Training defines the 10 Vietnamese members and um, the, the federal ministry and the ministry of the Hessen state define the German men members. And uh, within these, uh, these members consist of uh, members of the relevant ministries, but as well um, participants from the academic world. So we have members of presidential boards from other universities, uh, public universities in Vietnam, and public universities in Germany uh, within this, uh, this university council. They meet at least once a year. They have a talk meetings per video conferencing. So this year, thanks to COVID-19, unfortunately we won't have uh, a presence and an offline uh, meeting for the university council. So we are quite happy with this event today. This is a good training for us how to implement our university council meeting in December. 
and we have the possibility of circular decisions. So if something urgent is coming up, it's very difficult to get t 20 people uh, at the same time to, to, to one table. So we have the possibility for circular decisions for urgent issues. Um, the tasks, approval of matters submitted by the Senate or the, the presidential board. So it's not only the presidential board that can submit some, um, some applications to the University Council as well the Senate directly can, can do this. Uh, then we have no, uh, the nomination and dismissal uh, of uh, presidents and vice presidents. So uh, the, the University Council has to agree uh, if someone wants to become a, a president or vice president of VGU and they have to make resolutions concerning the obje objectives and activities of the university, evaluation on training and research activities, and they uh, discuss and decide, approve our tuition fees, financial management, and the allocation of resources. They, the University Council gives statements on the budget plans and uh, the reports on teaching and research. And as same as the, as the, the steering committee, uh, the University Council discusses long-term plans and especially the quality objectives of the university, discussed this with the presidential board and some members of the uh, Senate if necessary. Uh, we have a board of president, uh, a presidential board, composition one special solution again for a Vietnamese public university, one German president, one Vietnamese vice president for academic affairs, one German vice president uh, for administration, and one Vietnamese vice president for research. The board of presidents decides the task and functions of its members, so we set up our, our own set of, of rules, uh, and it gives an annual account of its operation to the University Council. Uh, the President leads and administers the University's activities and is responsible for the implementation of the University's function. So, standard, uh, I would say. What is new in the selection of Presidents? Uh, the search committee will, is comprised of two representatives of the Academic Senate. So that's the first time that members of the university will be in the selection committee for the, for the president and four representatives of the university council. The academic senate needs to vote for the president based on uh, the list of candidates. And uh, the one they selected must be approved, must be elected uh, by the university council. And uh, the, so these two steps must be passed through before someone can become a president of the Vietnamese German University. Upon the president's proposal, the vice presidents are selected by the academic senate and elected by and approved by the university uh, council and then appointed by the minister of education and training. Same for the president, by the way. Uh, the final appointment has to be done by the Minister of Education and Training. The next body, uh, the, the Academic Senate, we consists of voting members. So members with voting rights are the deans of the faculties, four representatives of the group of professors, senior lecturers and rec lecturers, two representatives of the academic employees, but not professors. So in general, uh, research and teaching assistants. Uh, one representative of the admin employees and one representative of the group of students. Non-voting members, the president and the vice presidents. The academic senate provides uh, consultation to the board of presidents on research, teaching, degree programs and other academic matters. It enacts and modifi uh, modifies the internal charters and regulations, so all regulations with, uh, for academic uh, concerns are decided by the academic senate of the university. 
it provides re recommendations to the University Council on the development plan, on teaching and research uh, <coughs> focus, on the establishment and closure of degree programs, for example, and on the discharge of a president or vice president. So uh, if the Sen Academic Senate does not accept a president anymore, they can decide, I think, with a two-third majority uh, to discharge a president and then give this for the final decision to the University Council. Um, the Faculty Council, so now we go down to the faculty level, uh, elected members with voting rights, the Dean, two representatives of the group of professors and lecturers, one other faculty members, RTAs or lab assistant, and one representative of the students. No voting, no voting rights uh, the, are the, the vice deans. They don't have them. What is the faculty down, uh, council deciding on? Issues, it issues the faculty study and examination regulation. So this is not on the top level of the university. That, uh, is done on the faculty level. It identifies the organizational structure of the faculty and decides on establishment of research units of the faculty proposal of professor appointment, and uh, use of faculty budget and facilities. This is an important point because we allocate the autonomy to decide on the budget allocated to the faculty. They, the faculty council has the right to decide where this money is going. So to invest it, for example, into a new research center or to support some, some specific uh, research projects, and so on and so on. Uh, proposal on implementation and abolishment of study programs, so the results of the faculty council go for approval to the, uh, up to the uh, academic senate and then for the final approval to the university council. Uh, to give you a general overview, uh, on the on the decision making uh, processes, um, you see it's a, we have we we have some is it working yeah but almost invisible we have some inner circles of decision making within the the senate and within the faculty council but as well we have decisions that are made in the faculty council that need to be approved by the senate that need to be approved by the University Council, and latest when it comes to money, uh, it needs finally to be approved by the steering committee when, when it is a lot of money that is not in the normal budget. And on the other uh, way down, uh, we have the, the uh, approval from the different bodies to the one on the lower level, and on the, on the right side, we have the more or less the classical uh, decision and, and uh, guidance um, model of uh, an administration. All the inner bodies of the VGU have been implemented within the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, the only ones that have been established quite early where the, uh, the University Council and the Presidential Board. So what lessons learned, what issues did we have to face? If you look at this way of decision making, this is a totally different approach than we normally see it in a traditional Vietnamese university. Uh, I remember very well one and a half years, two years ago, uh, we had a, a workshop in Da Nang with Stefan Hasebergen, hosted by Stefan Hasebergen, and when the German colleagues presented such a model of a German university, we had 20, 30 times the question, so he, who is the most powerful pro uh, person in the university? And the strange thing on the other side, the Germans did not even understand this question. Because in a German university, it's a community decision making. It's not about power. So if you see the complicated up and downs, I can't tell you if I am a powerful person in my university. I see myself more as a moderator 
between these bodies that they hopefully will make the right decisions. And uh, so we had to learn both the Vietnamese colleagues, the German colleagues, different bodies need to find and define their roles and responsibilities. So now if you go to a professor, an RTA or a student and tell this student you have the duty to decide on the future of the university. The student has just entered the university three semesters ago. You say, oh, how can I do this? Or you have leaders in the university and say, oh, till last year I could decide how to run this university and now I have to listen to the opinion of a student. And they will make the decisions for me and I have to implement it. So this was a very new way of leading, of governing a university. And uh, so we had and still have to learn a lot from each other. We, the, the, the bodies needed to define their rules of procedures. So it was not given from the legal framework, it was not given from the president, or it was not given from the university council. They have to find out and decide it on their own. What did they do? Or what, what are we still doing? We always spy to some model universities in Germany. So our blueprint is the Technical University of Darmstadt. And we always ask, How, what do your regulations look like? Please give it to us. And then we translate it to English. And then we discuss and say, OK, we can do this. We can't do that. And then we come to our own model. So as Professor Teichler mentioned, not only copying a blueprint from Germany to Vietnam, but looking at the blueprint and then discussing a discussion between Vietnamese and German colleagues. And if we don't know the way out, then we invite some colleagues from Germany and from Vietnam and say, please give us your opinion. We need someone to, to solve this problem in our minds. New allocation of responsibilities I have already mentioned within a Vietnamese public university. And the good thing, after a short period of uh, hesitation, the members of the inner bodies, step by step, accept their responsibility, accept their power. And we can see that we get a lot more of input from the university members. All university members talk to their peers who are members in the decision-making bodies. So we have a much broader support for the decisions made by the Senate than, and I'm quite convinced to that, um, that, than we had before when the presidential board made the decision. And the broader discussions of decision making um, to take within the bodies lead to a broader and more sustainable support of the implementation of decisions. Most important next steps, what is, I, as I mentioned uh, in my welcoming speech, we are really young. Next year we become a teenager, 13 years. Yeah? So we are still in a very young stage of development compared to the to the uh, German universities. We will have a presentation uh, in a few minutes uh, of uh, Dr. Erdmann, and I remember when he gave an, an introduction workshop uh, to us at VGU, he mentioned of the legal autonomy in the old university. They even used to have their own prison in, in Heidelberg University to lock up uh, those students uh, who, got, who came too drunk to the campus and uh, till they were sober. So most important steps, developing the new university charter, now based on the new three-party agreement, together with an expert panel, panel uh, submit the new draft to the Vietnamese government for approval uh, through the, uh, by the prime minister, and implementing a new special financial regime. I already talked about this as the sustainable financial uh, autonomy of the university based on the TPA and uh, to submit the draft to the Vietnamese government for the approval by the Prime Minister. The revision of the com uh, composition of the University Council, so uh, the University Council will be restructured a little bit because we will have the steering committee above 
we would love to have a stronger involvement of experts on higher education from other universities in Vietnam and Germany. This is a really important input for us. But on the other hand, I think the more colleagues we get, the more peers we get in our university council from Vietnamese university, they might grab one or the other idea and discuss it with their leaders in their university and maybe copy one or the other idea. That's what I hope. Uh, stronger involvement of experts from industry. This is again another point. So we have two points of influence. One is the academic world, uh, the, the higher education sector, and the other one is industry because our customers are our students. But at the same time as graduates, they are our products that we give away to industry. So we need to know what industry needs and we need to discuss it with them, how to implement, how to change and adapt our programs, but as well where to go with our research, especially here in Vietnam, that we do not basic research no one is interested in. We need a research outcome that is applicable for the industry in our neighborhood in Vietnam. That was the short overview about the governance of Viet the Vietnamese German University and its development after the past years. Thank you very much. We will now have another uh, presentation and then a Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Thomas Ben, for your sharing. Dear our guests, VTU's strategy is to customize excellent German study programs in the fields of engineering, information technology, as well as economics and management to not only meet the needs of Vietnamese higher education, but also follow the successful German models and standards concerning the academic and administrative governance and structures. In this conference, the overall pictures of German higher education institutes will be shared with you by the presentation from Dr. Dietma Atman, Vice Chairman for Administration, Vietnamese German University Consortium. Please welcome Dr. Dietma Atman. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Okay, that's lovely. Yes. It is a great pleasure for me to be able to talk to you. I must admit, I would be much rather be with you physically because the interaction, the personal interaction is a lot better than the digital one. However, the world is the way it is and we just have to accept it. I've been asked to speak about the topic of governance in higher education institutions in Germany. This is a subject which I could easily fill your entire conference with if you wanted to. However, the organizers have been, had had the wisdom to say only 30 minutes and hence I will only be able to give you a relatively short overview with particular reference to my personal experience. The institution that I come from is called KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which emanates from a merger of the then University of Karlsruhe and a neighboring Helmholtz Research Center. It goes without saying that mergers always revolve around the questions of governance. But also, in my previous institution, the University of Mannheim, we busied ourselves with questions of governance since we were then the pilots in establishing a university council in Germany. In my professional life, I've had the opportunity to look at HE governance from various angles. I started out as an academic at the University of Warwick in Great Britain. I've been a, an administrator at the, Fed, at the Land Ministry of Higher Education and I've been Chancellor of the University of Mannheim and the University of Karlsruhe. 
For this presentation, I would like to uh, adhere to the following agenda. I will give you a short overview on the complexity of HE governance. I will then give you the short history, as Professor Benz already mentioned a little bit about it. And I shall describe, thirdly, the legal requirements as laid out by the Constitutional Court and recommendations followed by the Scientific Council, the so-called Wissenschaftsrat, the highest German advisory body on academic questions. And finally, I will look at a few current examples of the diversity of HE governance and come to a few conclusions. Right, let's start with the overview. Now, Professor Teichler already mentioned, as you all know, Germany is a federal state consisting of 16 different entities called Länder. Article 30 of the Constitution regulates the relationship between the federal government and the Länder. And that is really important. It says, except otherwise provided or permitted by the basic law, the exercise of state power and the discharge of state functions is a matter for the lender. So this is really important to keep in mind that all laws regulating the governance of universities come from the state legislator. And they will differ considerably from one land to the other. For example, some lender prescribe a university council that has decision-making powers. Some only give it advisory functions. Some lender have no university council at all. Some have one with several, for several institutions. The federal government has no power to regulate university governance at all. However, it can define the governance of research institutions that are subjected to federal ministries. This is why when we had to discuss KIT's governance, we had to discuss it with a federal ministry and the opposite number in the land of Baden-Württemberg. And the land had to sign an agreement with the federal government regarding the running of the new institution because KIT is a university and at the same time a research center. Article 30 of the Constitution is also the reason why the trilateral uh, agreement that Professor Benz just mentioned uh, had to be signed by three parties, the Land of Hessen, the Federal Government of Germany, and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. They are all three contractual partners. The Federal Government of Germany on its own would not have been legally entitled to sign that agreement. Hence, HE governance in Germany is very diverse. There is no unified model. And even within a land, there can be variations if the law allows it. Okay, let's have a quick look at the historic development. University all over the world have long traditions. Vietnam's most renowned institution of higher learning is even older than Europe's first one in Bologna, and 300 years older than the University of Heidelberg, which is currently our oldest university. All of the old German universities have been founded as independent communities, a little bit like monasteries. Sometimes they were run by the community of scholars. Sometimes they were even run by the community of students. They often had their own jurisdiction, for as Benz just mentioned that, and they were all independent in making their own rules. For centuries, this remained unchallenged, since the founders of these universities had the good foresight to endow them with independent means of income, like forests or agricultural land or something else. It was only when 
university research became more and more costly, and the states were asked to contribute financially to the institution, that governments became interested in, running, in the running of the university and started to pass legislation. And furthermore, next to this financial aspect that attracted the attention of the legislators, it was the growth of participation rate of young people in higher education in the second half of the 20th century that really attracted the legislator to look at the sector more closely. When I left secondary school, only about 5% of an age group went on to university. Today, in some lender, we are approaching a participation rate of 50%. So the growing student number and the increasing demand for financial resources meant that states took a much greater interest in universities and started to regulate. However, the founders of our constitution had been wise enough to prescribe that arts and sciences, research and teaching shall be free. The freedom of teaching shall not release any person from allegiance to the constitution. But this means that the legislator only has very limited influence on the internal affairs of universities. Universities remain independent institutions. Sometimes, however, they'll need a little bit of help from the judiciary to defend their freedom, as we shall see in a minute. An analysis of the world's best universities, however, shows that academic and institutional independence are the best guarantee for excellence in teaching and research. In some parts of Switzerland, they've even reduced the Ministry of Higher Education to a small number of staff and limited the influence only to multi-annual target agreements. Hence, the question of university governance today is mainly the result of internal academic decision-making. Rules made by academics for academics. And the role of the state is only to guarantee a fair balance of interests between society and the interests of academia. Right, let's move on to number three, principles of HE governance in Germany. In 2014, the Constitutional Court had to decide over an action taken by members of the Academic Senate of the Medical University of Hanover against the Ministry of Higher Education in Lower Saxony. The plaintiffs felt that the law on higher education had taken away important powers from Senate and given them to the presidential board. At the same time, members of Senate were only in a minority in the committee that chose the members of the presidential board and decided on their dismissal. The court held that the law of Lower Saxony violated the academic freedom guaranteed by the federal constitution and had to be changed. The court pronounced the principle that if more powers in fundamental decisions are placed with the presidential board, the academic community, represented by Senate, has to have the final say in appointing or dismissing the members of the presidential board. This decision led to a change in many laws of higher education in various lender, since many parts of German legislators were trying to reduce the powers of Senate and strengthen the role of either the University Council or the Presidential Board. In view of these developments, 
the highest academic advisory group on the federal level, the Scientific Council, the Wissenschaftsrat, decided to make recommendations on university governance in 2018. The Council is formally an advisory group to the federal president and is composed of the most respected academics from all disciplines in Germany. Although it has no decision-making power, its recommendations are usually followed by Parliament. The Council held that universities have a dual nature. They are institutions and, at the same time, organizations. As institutions, they are the embodiment of values and traditions such as academic freedom, collegiality, and adherence to the advancement of knowledge. As organizations, they have to act like companies by setting targets, coordinating the, re uh, the use of resources, and ensure quality control. So good governance in a university means finding the right balance between those two sides, the organizational side and the institutional side. And in order to identify this balance, the Scientific Council came up with six criteria. First of all, they say it's all about decision-making. And decision-making has to be quick. However, secondly, it has to have acceptance by the community and, has to be, and the community has to feel it's legitimate. Thirdly, it has to be transparent. Fourthly, it should not be disruptive, it should be coherent. However, it must be robust in case of conflict. And sixth, it should be conscious of resources. And I'll tell you, resources is not only financial. Now, to apply these criteria would be really easy if they weren't permanently in conflict with each other. A powerful president could, quick, could ensure quick decision making but the decisions might not be widely accepted. If, on the other hand, decision-making is left to bodies of academics, it might have high legitimacy, but it could take a long time. That, in turn, has relevance for criterion six, resource consciousness, because, as I said, it's not only about finances. It includes the most valuable resource that academics have, and that is time. Time spent in endless committee meetings is time that will not be spent in preparing lectures, carrying out research, or publishing papers. So the balance has to be found by each institution. There is no one-size-fits-all. The culture of the institution will play an important role in defining this balance. Old traditional institutions might emphasize the, leg the legitimacy of decision-making, thus accepting a much slower decision-making process involving a lot of meeting time. In Germany, technical universities tend to be more conscious of time and effort spent in meetings whereas universities with strong faculties of humanities enjoy long debates and don't regard time spent in meetings as wasteful. Newly founded institutions are often happier with strong hierarchy, whereas in universities with a long tradition of self-governance would be quite opposed to hierarchical decisions. It's also a question of size of the institution. The smaller you are, the less formal you can be. It might also be necessary to adjust the balance over time. Maybe because the institution has grown in size, 
maybe because new disciplines bring new cultures. Extraordinary external events can call for a change, possibly for a limited period. The aim of the balance, however, must always be to ensure the confidence of the academic community in its procedures. The Scientific Council has developed an instrument to help each institution to analyze its governance. In it, four governance modes are looked at. Collegial self-organization, competition, negotiation, and hierarchy. All four modes are used in institutions for different situations. Collegial self-organization is the most commonly used mode. It is often not even formally described in the university charter. It just happens. Actors can be individuals, but also bodies like faculties or institutes. The mode largely depends on commonly shared values like quality or academic standards. It works well in areas where these values are truly shared by majority. Now that is the difference to the negotiation mode. Here it is que simply the question of prioritization of different interests. If the question is whether faculty A should get a new building or faculty B, there will not be a commonly shared value, but there will be clear and vested interests. Thus, the use of the various modes depends on the subject that needs to be addressed. If we have a question of academic content and quality, such as the structure of a degree program or the standard of an examination, collegial self-organization is a good choice. If, however, questions of legal implication need to be decided, neither collegial self-organization nor negotiation should be employed. You need a hierarchical structure that defines what is acceptable and what is not, and hence you have then people who are accountable for this decision. If the decision involves strategic differentiation, collegial self-organization will probably not be helpful, since it tends to equalize rather than differentiate. Negotiations may, might also not be the right mode, since it usually favors people with greater power. Hence, resource allocation, whether financial or indeed the use of infrastructure, could very well be dealt on a competitive basis, provided the rules for the competition have been either internally agreed or defined externally. For long-term academic strategies, a combination of hierarchical input and alternating negotiations between all players followed by a hierarchical decision-making that considers the various interests could be advisable. As I've said before, there is no master solution or template for every institution, neither in Germany and probably also not in Vietnam. The Scientific Council has drawn up a chart weighing the pros and cons of the various government's modes against the criteria set out in the beginning. As you can see, collegial self-organization is risky for quick decision-making, but guarantees individual autonomy and gives legitimacy and acceptance. It uses up a lot of time, though. Competition, on the other hand, can promote decision-making and can also give legitimacy and acceptance, but is not good for cohesion, since it tends to be disruptive. It may require additional resources, financial or infrastructural, and is also time-intensive, since either it requires consensus of the rules of competition 
if the competition is internal or if it is external, it requires peer review. In Germany, like in many other countries of the Western world, it has become increasingly difficult to recruit sufficiently respected academics for such evaluations. Negotiations can also be time consuming. They are potentially favorable to the individual autonomy. And the Scientific Council suggests that they also give legitimacy and acceptance. I would add that depends very strongly on how transparent these negotiations are. Hierarchy has two strong points, quick decision making, resource sensitivity, but it might lead to problems of acceptance. That in a university, which is only, as we all know, a loosely coupled organization, can be a problem. At least in Germany, there are many ways to evade a decision of the presidential board if it's not widespread consensus that this decision is fair. I will come to my last point, giving a few examples of governance practices in Germany and a quick conclusion. In the first overview, I'd like to show you how diverse the rules of, regarding governance are by taking just a simple, a small example, and that is the composition of the University Council. This chart only refers to universities. It does not include research centers. If, they, if research centers were included, it would be even more complex. So if you look at this chart, you can see that 14 out of the 16 lender actually have provisions in their HE law about the establishment of a university council. Bremen has none. Brandenburg has one council for all the higher education institutions of the land, but allows the establishment of individual ones in the university charter. The size varies considerably from five in Schleswig-Holstein and Sachsen-Anhalt to 22 in Berlin. Sachsen-Anhalt only has external members, but they are elected by Senate so that the autonomy of the institution is guaranteed. In 12 Länder, there are representatives of ministries on the University Council, but only in three they have voting rights. Hence, in a majority of German universities, there is little or no influence on, or direct influence at least, on, uh, by the ministries in the University Council. In view of the time, I'm not going to go into details about the composition of the Senate. It just shows again the complexity and the different regulations. Let's conclude. We can conclude from these few examples that there is no standard of governance in German universities. However, there are a number of principles. Principle one, the role of the state, i.e. the land, is quite limited. This refers not only to teaching and research. In most institutions today, the financial support by the governments is given in the form of a block grant, which allows the university to set its own priorities. The professorial salary scheme offers usually great flexibility when it comes to hiring specialists. In a few lender, the budget for new uh, constructions is separate. Otherwise, the decision to build new buildings is included in the university autonomy. In some lender, government policies are negotiated with the institutions in a multi-annual target agreement, which is then subject to the approval of either Senate or University Council, or both. And it is important to stress the word agreement. Both the university and the ministry have to agree 
And within the university, it is not only the presidential board, but through the participation of Senate and or University Council, it includes large parts of the academic community, including students. And the second principle is university autonomy not only faces towards the state, but it has also relevance internally. If you recall the six criteria for good governance of the Wissenschaftsrat, they all describe aspects of internal autonomy. The university is an institution, is a community of academics. And the Constitutional Court has held that means that the community always has to have the last say. And if the university management possesses strong decision making powers, then the community, as represented by Senate, has to be able to change that management if they don't like the decisions. The degree of internal autonomy depends on the choice of the institution. Uh, the choice will be conditioned by institutional values depending on age, size and disciplines. The relevant rules will be laid down in the University Charter and Professor Benz has already outlined that VGU will now go into that process and define a new charter. This can be quite a lengthy process. In my own University Karlsruhe, when we merged with the research center to become KIT, it took almost two years before the charter was finally agreed because certain core values differed quite strongly between the academics of the university side and the scientists of the research center side. The right balance for individual autonomy had to be found as well as a common understanding with two ministries, one on the federal level and on the land level, and how much governmental influence is acceptable or indeed necessary. As a new model university, VGU will have to pave that path. It may take a little bit of time to come to the right format and should involve all the stakeholders. Thus, VGU's governance could be a model not only for Vietnam, but maybe also for the entire region. But my impression is that VGU is very well equipped for this and VGU's German partners are always happy to help if needed. Thank you very much. So. Thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Dietmar Edmund. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, there's a slight change in our agenda today, so we will continue with the next section of the conference. Dear honor guests, we are very proud that VTU is the first university in Vietnam to invest in a comprehensive information system to support the university operation in an effectively and efficiently way. Integrated Campus Management System, ICMS, is the important subcomponent belong to the World Bank's funded projects component one. The system is understood as the ERP to support the integrated campus management. And to have, in order to have an insightful understanding about our system, please welcome back on stage Professor Thomas Benz, the president of VTU, for the sharing on the topic, introductions of ICMS and forcing challenges during the implementations and operation phases. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, me again. Uh, now about our campus management system. So, a simple piece of software. Easy. This morning at the Consul Gen Consulate General, I met uh, a representative of SAP, and I just complained that we are fighting with his system. <laughs> um, what does it mean? Let me first talk about the foundation. 
The foundation to implement a complex software system, that means that we first needed to analyze in detail what are we doing in the administration, in the academic field. What do our processes look like? So, the initial state of process management. We started in 2015. IT strategy, strategy consulting package. There you can see some of the delay we implemented in our history. The bidding document took us from 2016 to December 2019 to get it done finally. The process management development in 2017. So for about one year, we had specialists at the university interviewing our staff about their daily work, about their processes, and modeling about 260 business processes. Fortunately, we could uh, cut it down to a more reasonable number, but it's still far beyond 100. And then at the end, with the ICMS bidding, we started in January the project of the ICMS kickoff, so the, pro the project of implementation. In a company, this implementation normally takes between one and two years, if everything is going well. I've seen companies going bump bankrupt in this process because they did not manage their business processes properly and could not adapt their processes to the new system and they could not adapt the system to their processes. So this was a, a huge challenge for our staff to come to the go live target end of November when the, we have the deadline for the, um, for the World Bank loan. And so we had a fixed deadline. Whatever we would do, we had to be ready on the 30th of uh, November. Ms. Zung is very strict in these things. <laughs> um, so, and it's not one piece of software. We had to cover the student life cycle. We had to cover all financial business processes within the university. We need to cover the HR processes within the university and an integrated document management service. So four independent software packages that needed to be integrated into one. So when our staff gets access to the software, they should have more or less the feeling it's one system, which means all data should be running transparently through all different modules of the system. So a transparent instrument for performance monitoring, reporting, decision making of the university. And so we have a joint venture, uh, led by FPT here in Vietnam, but as a strong partner we have FSI and we have Serosoft, an Indian uh, software company. So under normal circumstances, this is already a challenge. But shortly after TED, we had COVID-19. And we had a lockdown. And we still have a partial lockdown in India. So all the implementation with the Indian colleagues, and for a certain time, even with the FPT colleagues, with the Vietnamese colleagues here, we had to work remotely. Just imagine, many of our staff had to sit in video conferences for six, seven hours a day to discuss with the software providers how to develop, how to go on, how to proceed, uh, how to understand what is going on. So I already mentioned the, the different modules, the so, uh, student life cycle management system that ministers almost the whole life of our students. So from the first application till the graduation and even beyond, we try to keep contact to our alumni. The uh, financial, man uh, fi financial management uh, information system plan, organize, control, and monitor the financial resources of the university and manage the accounting activities. And the 
uh, HR uh, management system to manage effectively uh, the, the university organization and the document management system itself. The project, we had the kickoff beginning of January this year. So we came out of our Christmas holidays from Germany. At that time, we were happy that we still could travel. We did not know what would come up during the year. We had the kickoff, repair, update, confirm the business requirements documents. Then we had the challenge to explore, to define and compare, uh, confirm gap lists with the software providers. So we had to find out, and our staff members are not IT specialists. They are specialists in their field of administration. They are not IT specialists. They are not business process specialists. They had to check, to control, to analyze the business processes uh, that were implemented in the system and to identify gaps, to work on the business blueprint, the integration of the business processes document and the go-life plan. Then from June, mid of June till mid of August, the uh, realize uh, phase, configuring uh, and unit tests of the ICMS system, collect and clarify the migrate master data. So just imagine where we are coming from. We have an HR system and we have uh, MISA as a financial and accounting system towards the, um, towards the state treasury. But, and we have a, a student information system developed by two of my students in 2012 here at VGU. But the rest is done in Excel and in Word. So a manual data management and to guarantee that the data that we bring into the system are correct, to analyze the data, that could not be done by our software suppliers. That had to be done by our staff. And then the deploy phase from mid, uh, end of July till end of October, so to finalize uh, the, the production system for GoLive, to migrate master data and to begin uh, uh, beginning balances data, to uh, train the end users and uh, the end users to practice in the ICMS system. Normally you can say what an administrative person is working during the day is 50, 60 percent with the administrative software package. So what our staff had to do for the last 11 months means they had to manage their daily work and they were all, when they were almost done they had to do the same thing on the new system. At the beginning analyzing their processes, understanding their business processes, no longer thinking in a separate functions. So this is what I know, this is what I do, and I don't look left, I don't look right. Now understanding that I am part of a chain of process steps and to analyze, is this what the software providers implement? Is it what we need? Is it what we live in our daily administrative life? This was a huge challenge and a huge extra package of work for 11 months and we are not yet at the end. Even if the software is fully deployed, if we have the pass the go live, for at least another four or five months, we will still have to learn, to control, to check this software system. And uh, so hopefully within, till the end of, the, uh, of this month, we have the go live and the support. We deliver the ICMS, uh, system to the IT team that then will be responsible that we have a reliable and always uh, 724 available uh, software system and to confirm the completion of the project. Because if we don't confirm the completion, then Wellcon won't allow us to pay the suppliers and then we will be in trouble. So uh, you can see it's a huge effort beyond all the other efforts we are taking in the development of this university. Challenges, I've already mentioned some of them. Uh, the project faced several challenges from the second phase 
which caused some delay in the project. Originally, we wanted to be ready in September. Uh, I mentioned COVID-19 outbreak. That costed us a lot of time and effort, but the suppliers and our staff managed to overcome this and to really, with hard work, to get this sorted out. Another huge uh, challenge was a different approach of implementing software. You see, we insisted that first all business processes me need to be clear, need to be proven that they that that what we need is implemented in the software before we really meant, uh, went to the implementation. So this costed a lot of time because neither the colleagues from FPT, not those ones from the Indian uh, uh, company, seem to have ever worked in continuous uh, process change over a whole company or over a whole uh, institution. The resources during the project. The project implementation time has been planned initially for around nine months. There has been massive workload for project management team and for the key users and finally now for the end users till we know how to run this system. Um, the ICMS is expected to be a holistic system in various management fields. So the integration requirements among the different modules are highly demanding for the software suppliers and for us in the beginning to check is everything what you, what you submit in one module, for example, in the student life cycle. If you enroll a student in the, in the student life cycle system, is there in the financial management system an invoice created? Will there be a confirmation when the student has paid? And this means now we have the confirmation of the enrollment. All these thing, things need to be checked. Uh, the ICMS IT infrastructure relies on the hardware package. This hardware package we managed to get approved in July this year. So last week, I think, the hardware arrived and now finally we can uh, set it up and uh, make it run and then transfer the software packages from the interims, uh, from the interim server to the final server that have the capability to really run this system in a re reliable way. Lessons learned. ICMS will contribute in making the governance and academic development work smoother at Vichy. What does that mean? You see, we have still quite a big turnover of stuff. And you can describe a business process, you can model it, you can have wonderful graphs, but you need people with experience. We need people who know what they are doing day by day, and not only for their own work, they must understand what are the steps before mine and what are the steps after mine, so that I can deliver the right information at the right time, that I can do the right actions at the right time. So with the ICMS, we are now in the box. The software tells us what to do. And this makes our processes much more reliable than they have been in the past. And so hopefully, it will be a big relief for our staff in terms of their responsibility, but as well in terms of a lower workload. That's what I really hope of these stressful 11 months that they went through uh, this year. It will be strong, consistent, and scalable on the long run, adapting flexibility to changes in the management framework and to future challenges of digital transformation area. So it will help us to be ready for the futures in our business processes, in our daily work, and it will give us a strong support, and uh, it needs, needed, a strong support and commitment from the top leaders, from the heads of departments and colleagues uh, that have, uh, has needed and has been provided. So a big thank you at that point from my side to the VGU staff, 
who took this burden without complaining over almost one year and to make this thing happen. And uh, hopefully, I would estimate after TET, we can really feel the first success of running this new system, of uh, running it smoothly uh, and, and much more uh, reliable than it has to be in the, in the past. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I could give you a short insight in what we went through with the new uh, integrated campus management system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Benz, for your sharing. And now it's time for the panel's discussions. I would like to invite on stage Dr. Ha Thuk Wing, the Vice President of VTU, to come on stage to be the moderator. So good evening. I hope you are not so tired after the long travel and the full day workings. So now we come to the very important, also interesting sections. Uh, we already hearing about five speaks and presentations from our international scholars and also those who are experts in the area from Vice Minister Fuchs to Ms. Jung from World Bank, Rosa Benz, the President of Vietnamese German University, and also two other German experts in the field of higher education. Our topics from very general, like the higher, higher education reforms in Vietnam, about the overviews of the excellence and Ivory University development from World Bank experience throughout the world. Then we already learned about how diversity is the university governance in Germany from lender to lender. And then we also see how important in applying strategic planning approach for develop master plan of the university and how the master plan of the university plays importance on the, the university developments, the master plans will lead us to our right destination, destinations. And then you also see we are in the, the IT era. We are in the digital transformation era. So the university needs the better and faster and more reliable support decision-making support systems. And what you already learned, the presentations from presentation of Professor Thomas Benz just presents the ICMS. The original name is EIB, or the so-called enterprise resource planning. And later then, we see that term somehow not well fit with the university. So we, we use the term integrated campus management, where it reflects the real manner of the systems. And I think VGU is one of the pioneer, pioneer uh, institutions in Vietnam to apply to, to install these systems. But and you also see, already see many challenges we are facing. I, I do not see the problem, but we see the challenge. And whenever challenge still exist in front of us, the development still ahead. So, with what we are already learned from very excellent speaks and presentations. So now it's time for open question and answer. I would like very much to, to invite first Professor Thomas Benz, VGU President, the second, Ms. Vokyu Yung, the Senior Specialist of Education from the World Bank, and also Task Team Leader of uh, Vietnamese German University uh, 
projects. And then I would also like to invite Professor Nguyen Thu Thi, the General Director of Higher Education Department of MOES, to be on the stage for these sections. So you are welcome. And I would also very much like to connect with the two dear colleagues from Germany, Professor Teisler and Dr. Edmonds. So I hope that you will be get a lot of questions from our colleague today. Yes, I saw you, you, you are ready. You, you are ready there. So thank you. Uh, so the important version on my in the window and I'm in front here. Uh, so Dr. Dietmar, Professor Teisler, whether you, you got, can you hear it? Can you hear it? Yes. 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 That's okay. okay. Good. So, so, now I would like to open these sections and third questions. And I, I, I would like to add our spotter to, to, to go throughout in order to keep microphones in most convenient way. Uh, okay, please. Could you please introduce yourself, uh, where you come from, your institutions, and your position in the university so far? That would be very helpful for our speaker and also colleague from Germany too. Yeah. Uh, tôi uh, từ Đại học Văn Lang. Tôi uh, uh, rất cảm ơn cái uh, chia sẻ của các cái, uh, giáo sư, các cái chuyên gia ngày hôm nay. Thì uh, góc độ chúng tôi đó thì uh, chúng tôi <cười> À, rất là thấy rằng là có rất là nhiều cái kiến thức và những kinh nghiệm rất là bổ ích à, chúng tôi xin hỏi một cái câu thế này tức là với cái đầu tư lớn như là Đại học Việt Đức khoảng 180 triệu đô la và cái cộng đồng sinh viên hiện nay theo tôi biết đó, là khoảng chừng 2 ngàn mấy đến 3 ngàn vậy thì cái mô hình tài chánh của các bạn như thế nào để mà mình có thể vận hành được À, trong cái uh, cấu trúc tài chánh và đầu tư lớn và cái số học sinh nó khá là khiêm tốn như vậy và nếu được thì có thể cũng cho biết cái 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 cái, cái, cái doanh thu đó trong một vài năm gần đây và nếu uh, nó hụt đó, nó không đủ cái, cái chi phí vận hành đó, có đủ không với cái doanh thu đó với cái đầu tư đó thì cái học phí có đủ không và nếu đủ thì thì uh, cái tình trạng nó thế nào hoặc là nếu thiếu thì cái cơ chế bù đắp cái cái dòng tài chánh cho cái đại học Việt Đức nó thế nào và cái khả năng à, hình như tôi biết là cái cái vốn tài trợ này nó là, là vốn ODA đúng không thì cái cơ chế hoàn vốn hoặc là tài trợ của chính phủ như thế nào thì cái câu hỏi này có lẽ là mời à, giáo sư Ben à, hiệu trưởng và World Bank à, chia sẻ thêm về cái cái những cái 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 dữ liệu mà chúng tôi Uh, quan tâm. Xin cảm ơn. Uh, dạ, rất cảm ơn anh là cái uh, cái câu hỏi của anh nó lại đến sớm hơn cái dự kiến của chúng tôi. Uh, bởi vì lẽ ra là cái phần mà tài chính bình vững thì tôi, chúng tôi dành vào buổi chiều mai. Uh, uh, lý do tại sao? Bởi vì tôi biết hiện nay rất nhiều đại học quan tâm về vấn đề đó. Uh, và tôi nghĩ đại học ở Việt Nam hay trên thế giới đều quan tâm đến vấn đề đó. Uh, nhưng mà cái câu hỏi của anh thì nó lại đến sớm hơn hôm nay. Uh, tôi cũng uh, xin mời giáo sư Ben uh, có thể chia sẻ rất là ngắn gọn. À, và tôi hy vọng là anh sẽ tham dự hội thảo này đến buổi chiều mai và có thể chúng ta sẽ có một cái buổi thảo luận hấp dẫn hơn vào chiều chiều ngày mai xin cảm ơn Professor Ben Thank you Dr. Vinh um, Yeah a, a very short answer um, We have a special financial model for VGU So we have a, a support from the German side for our flying faculty and for the administration German administrative employees, which is in total about uh, 3.1, uh, 3.6 million euros per year, and we have uh, the with the with the, after the three-party uh, agreement, we have uh, the guarantee that the Vietnamese government will take over the majority of the running costs. That means at the moment that we get the same amount that we collect in tuition fees from OED as support for the running costs. This for now, more tomorrow. <laughs> yes, I think the rest 
of your questions will be tomorrow. I hope you will attend tomorrow so then full question will be answered. Okay? Good. So I have to stand up. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm to introduce myself. I come from Bang Lang University too. So thank you very much for all the keynote speaker today. Very interesting with all the presentation. And also thank you very much because we have a, a, a new model of university to learn. I'm very interested in uh, ICMS system. And I think that's very good system for all the university, not only for BGU university. So my question that whether it's possible that World Bank and Moet that can like transfer such model for all the university to apply. Yeah, thank you. I think for these questions, first uh, you may you, you already answer, but I think the ICMS somehow is have to figure out and fit with the certain university, right? And then I think later for Ms. Jung can answer about whether one bank can can support to transfer that system to other university. So I think I think our government have to to get further low interest loan, loan. Okay, good, please. Either you or Ms. Yu. Yes, okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Very interesting one. You know, uh, uh, from the, the, the government point of view, of course, we, we are very happy if we can do uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the best model, right? The best system for every uh, university in the country. That's our, <laughs> our dream, our ambition. Uh, but it depends on a, a lot of conditions, you see. Um, uh, the, the case of EU is a very special case uh, in the international partnership between two US, uh, the two governments and even three parties, not only two parties, you see. Uh, and a lot of efforts have been put into this project. And you see, for the last 12 years, we have just got to, to this process, to, to this point, a lot of challenges. Many things uh, have been done so far. So you can, you, you can imagine the difficulties and challenges ahead. We are trying our best to, to, uh, to make more investment and to get more uh, partnership and the support from uh, uh, international organizations and our international partners uh, to uh, improve the system and also to spread out the models to, to other universities. We have the new master plan uh, for the network of uh, higher education institutions and uh, universities in general uh, for the next 10 years. And um, uh, according to the strategic master plan and also the strategic framework for development of higher education, we hope that we will uh, uh, gather, we can uh, uh, mobilize much more funds and resources to improve the system. But you see that uh, Van Lang University and other non-public universities are now developing a lot. So you see that the investors, not only from the domestic uh, market, but also international markets, are, are, are looking at Vietnam's higher education as a very potential market, potential place for, for, for investment. And why not? The public and non-public sectors together, hand in hand, we do the best things for higher education in Vietnam, right? Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Xiong, please. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Just, just a quick one in terms of uh, whether the knowledge can be transferred. So today, VGU is hosting this conference for that reason. So on the sharing of the um, ups and downs, the challenges that VGU is going through in the development of IT strategy and the ICMS is being shared right now. Uh, and of course, you can continue working with the VGU to get more information about something? that. Sorry, can you, can you hear? Yes, I hear. Can I say some respond something? Yes, let me, let me finish. I have uh, the yeah. second part uh, of my answer uh, to share with the team. Um, and I think um, in terms of uh, whether you uh, can have uh, further support from the government uh, for this, there's many ways of getting to that. It may cost a few millions to VGU, but you can uh, have different stages of development. 
But most importantly, as Dr. Ben, uh, Professor Ben has already mentioned, it's not only about the software or about the hardware. It's about the whole cultures of the organization. It's about how you organize yourself to manage the system. That needs to come together or even come first before you procure a software or a hardware. Thank you so much. So I think Moet will transfer the policy. One bank transfer money. VGU transfer knowledge and experience. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Professor Teisler. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say uh, I found it interesting with that all the presentations which we have heard now have pointed out that the decision-making processes in the Vietnamese German University are enormously complex uh, because we want to bring together the different ideas which come from the management, from the staff, from especially academics, from students, and then also both from various side, from the Vietnamese side, we have different traditions, from Germany, we have different traditions, how to understand each other, and eventually bring all these different positions to, together. And you see, my my task has been in, in, uh, to prepare these draft master plans for practically for the decision making of the university council. And you see, the university council is meeting a few hours once a year, but its its uh, task is to integrate now in the decision all these different views and positions of the different actors and of the two cultures and on top of this want to develop a prototype which is interesting for other countries of the world. This is really demanding. Yes, I was happy to do this job for uh, for five years, yeah, to interview all the people in advance. You see, what is your opinion? Why do you believe you have a different opinion than the other? Is there a difficulty of understanding what's going on in Vietnam, what's going on in Germany, and what are the expectations? So I enjoyed interviewing the different actors and, uh, uh, and tr tried just to write this uh, up in the master plans and say here there seems to be a consensus emerging and here it is normal that there are still various views and there is needed negotiations to come to a conclusion. So I must say I enjoyed let's say to be in charge of just documenting this complexity as a starting point for decisions and I hope, of course, I get older, you might need other people in the future for doing this, but I really hope that you put in some energy of preparing the complexity of decisions so that no one feels to be overlooked. Okay, thank you, Professor Tashle. So, next, please. How, how? Lady first. Yeah, Sorry. thank you. Uh, so I would like to uh, introduce uh, myself and it's my partner in here. Uh, we are come from Thái Nguyên University of Technology and it's north of Hanoi. Uh, so we are uh, interested in I ICMS system. So we have uh, several questions for uh, Mr. Ben. Uh, yeah, As, uh, for the ICSM, uh, ICMS system, um, we would like to ask you about uh, um, how, uh, how, to, uh, how to use the cost uh, for I ICMS uh, system. As the second one is uh, for the ICMS system, uh, 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 we would like to ask uh, for the you uh, for the v, VZU uh, uh, can share for uh, maybe it's for my university also and also for the other university in here um, and we can use 
for your system. And the, uh, the third question here, uh, we would like to uh, ask about the regulation of organization and uh, operation of VGU. Um, and uh, we can, this is, uh, is, is possible, we can, uh, we can, um, uh, Oh, we can uh, maybe it's, we can use or maybe we can get the information uh, of your organization and operation uh, in your university. Um, so it's uh, and the next question here is: uh, Could you please say something, uh, some differences between um, between um, a scientist? scientist Councils and education councils, and um, uh, the last question here is sorry. Um, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, is, uh, I, I have a, a lot of you. questions for in your my university. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> many and long questions. Yeah. <laughs> first, I would like to, to check with you. Bạn hỏi là cost hay là cost? Cost, đúng không? Okay, first questions about the cost for ICMS systems. Get no, it. it's the, the price. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, cost. You. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and the, yeah. Second, <laughs> the second is about... How to say this systems with the uh, yeah. colleagues? So, uh, with, with our, let, uh, let me first answer yep. the two uh, first questions, otherwise I will for have forgotten them until you uh, are at the end. So, the co to be honest, the university would never have been able to afford this system if we would not have the World Bank loan. The cost of the software, and this is already the lowest price that we could get on the market, is one million US dollars for the software. And when it comes to ERP system, the minimum cost that you have to add is the same amount for the, uh, for the hardware, for the servers and the infrastructure that you need. And in the companies, normally, you ignore the costs inside of the company. So if we would really take into account the costs that we have invested into the system with the work time of our staff, labor costs are not as high as in Europe. In Europe, it would be the same amount once again. So here, it might be around $300,000, $400,000. So we are talking about a package of $2.4 million of investment for such a software system. So if your university would like to go for this, you can't do it at once. So you need to prioritize. I'm sure you have MISA for the finance. You might have some other system for the HR. So you could start with a system for the student life cycle management. And as soon as we are done, we have now a lot of people who have quite a good experience, and I'm sure they are keen to share this, expe uh, this experience with you and other universities here in Vietnam. So whenever you are interested, maybe from May next year on, when everything is running smoothly, it could be interesting for us to set up a team who can come to you or invite you to our university, especially next year when we move to our wonderful new campus, uh, to invite you, to show you around about the software, the hardware, to give you an impression, and then discuss with you a feasible solution over the years. This must grow. You can't do it at once because you won't have the financial means to do this. But there are possibilities to do it step by step. Okay, thank you. Bạn nhắc lại cái câu hỏi cuối cùng về cái hội đồng khoa học và hội đồng giáo dục là ý sao để tôi biết được để tôi tôi chuyển tải cái ý của của Ừ hỏi câu này tức là một cái là hội đồng này là hội đồng tư vấn còn cái hội đồng kia là hội quyết định. Tôi nghĩ là trong cái hồi nãy trong cái báo cáo về cái governance của giáo sư Ben thì nó có mấy cái việc một là 
hội đồng trường vâng. hai là cái senate là cái hội đồng nội trị và vâng, xin phép có thầy em hỏi thêm một chút ạ tức là cái ở trong cái quy định của luật giáo dục Việt Nam cái quy gọi điều lệ trường đại học Việt Nam ấy thì đang nói về cái các hội đồng mà bao gồm hội đồng khoa học và đào tạo khoa học đào tạo là một này hội đồng khoa là hai này. các hội đồng đều hội đồng tư vấn thôi tư vấn cho hiệu trưởng và tư vấn cho trưởng khoa thôi thì còn khác biệt mà chỗ uh, giáo sư Ben có nói thu hát Ben có nói thì cái hội đồng mà khoa học tức là academic council ấy, với lại cái hội đồng khoa tức là facility uh, faculty council ở đây thì lại là quyết định tức là có những cái có những quyết định những nội dung thì vậy thì cái cái muốn giải thích thêm cái đấy cái khái niệm quyết định ấy là thế nào à, xin hết. cái này tôi chắc để tôi giải thích cho nó nhanh luôn vâng. À, cái vấn đề chính của cái câu chuyện là về cái cái hệ thống quản trị trong một đại học ấy à, Tức là khi mà set up cái, cái trường này đó Và tiếp cận cái mô hình này đó Thì chúng ta giữa chúng ta và Đức có nhiều thảo luận Trước đó để chúng ta chuẩn bị tinh thần Và cái quan điểm của chúng ta là tiếp cận những mô hình Của những cái quốc gia mà phát triển Nên trong cái bài phát biểu của giáo sư Tyler Ông có nói là tiếp cận một cái mô hình đại học Của từ một cái quốc gia mà phát triển hơn chúng ta thì tiếp cận ở đó chúng ta không chỉ là đơn thuần là chương trình đào tạo đúng không và dự án nghiên cứu mà chúng ta tiếp cận mô hình quản lý thì cái việc mà để tiếp cận mô hình quản lý đó thì chính phủ đã có một cái quy chế tổ chức hoạt động cho trường đại học Việt Đức và do thủ tướng ban hành thì trong cái quy chế đó được xây dựng giữa hai bên Việt Nam và Đức và trao đổi rất cụ thể là cái cấu trúc quản trị và quá trình ra quyết định của trường đại học Việt Đức như thế nào đó. Nên khi bắt đầu thành lập và vận hành trường Đại học Việt Đức Thì mọi hoạt động được dựa vào cái đó Được xem như là một cái luật cho trường Đại học Việt Đức đó. Và đến sau này thì gần đây chúng ta mới bắt đầu Chúng ta thấy luật giáo dục Đại học 2012 Rồi sau này mới cái luật mới vừa mở Mới vừa ban hành cách đây một năm Thì những cái điểm mà rất mới đầu tiên ngày xưa đó Ở Đại học Việt Đức Thì lần lần nó đã hiện hữu trong cái luật mới của chúng ta hiện nay đó. À, Tuy nhiên À, để mà theo cái cách tiếp cận của Đức thì nó có những cái nguyên tắc mà hồi nãy ông à, tiến sĩ Dietzma ông đã giới thiệu cái, cái cấu trúc quản trị trong trường đại học Đức, Đức trong trường đại học Đức nó như thế nào ở à, giữa các bang nó khác nhau thế nào quyền lực của à, cái hội đồng trường như thế nào quyền lực của cái à, hội đồng nội trị như thế nào rồi vai trò của hội đồng khoa nó như thế nào à, à, có những điểm nó tương đương mà có những điểm nó khác biệt ví dụ tôi có thể giải thích hiện nay hội đồng Trường của trường của trong luật giáo dục Việt Nam Nó là một mô hình Mít giữa hội đồng trường Và hội đồng nội trị của trường Đại học Việt Đức đó, Và trong khi xây dựng Hội thảo xây dựng cái luật Mà đại học mới ban hành đó Thì tôi có được Khá nhiều lần được mời đến góp ý Và tôi đã có góp ý cái phần này đó, Thì đó có thể cho chúng ta thấy Điểm giống và điểm khác nhau không đó. Đó. Nên bởi vì chúng ta không có nhiều thời gian Nên là cho tôi xin phép dừng lại chỗ đây ha Cảm ơn chị Rồi xin mời Dạ, xin mời thầy ạ À rồi, dạ xin lỗi Dạ mời thầy Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation I do understand that it is a very long journey and a lot of obstacle and you, you, you can overcome So my name is Anh A.N.H Uh, from the Van Hien University uh, for the medical and uh, pharmaceutical department. So uh, my question is, from the presentation of the Dr. Hunrich said that um, the university can be the f first 200 top leading university in the world. So how can to do it and how you measure it to be the top Uh, 200 in up to this year 2020. So how come, please, dear? Yeah. Okay, Professor Tesla, very interesting questions. Yes, I wanted to say, uh, yes, I think when a new university is founded, it is normal that we make some kind of, let's say, I would say over optimistic plans at the beginning and that we learn in the process of implementation that we have to become a bit more realistic. Mm -hmm. I think it was good that when the university started, it had 
ambitious plans. It wanted to be a, a high uh, quality institution and it could, that it could be important also for other things to say that transnational universities, binational universities can be top universities in the world. So in this way, I think it was a good plan. But as I said, when you, uh, when you have every year two or three new programs and it takes, they are taught six years primarily by flying faculty and not yet new academic staff to do research within the university. It is just normal, you see, that it takes some time uh, to reach such a level. So that's why we could, I think a, a person like me who is doing higher educational research and uh, sometimes advice planners, I could have said from the beginning it is clear uh, that this ambitious goal cannot be reached within 12 years. It is clearly taking more than 20 years or even 30 years. But um, uh, but still, this is one thing. And second, you see, uh, I have a critique of the rankings of world-class universities. When you see how they measure this world-class, they often measure only in terms of academic quality. Yeah, just and, and they measure it operational often in just what kind of publications they have, famous publications, academically high received. Uh, whereas I, I think it is normal of a high quality university in Vietnam or Southeast Asia, in mid-income countries, in low-income countries, that they do not only look at this high quality, but from the beginning also say, what is a proper balance between academic quality and relevance for the culture, society, economy and technology of a country. And there I, I would have said it would have been good if from the very beginning this balance had been underscored. So in this way I believe that the mission statement in the Charter some a few years ago, uh, was it 2016 or 17? I forgot. Was a more balanced thing, and I, yeah, I believe that if everything goes good, people in Vietnam soon will be convinced, and the region that this balance of quality and relevance is good, and also I hope that this this will be a world class university, but. We, be patient. This this we can only measure after 2030 at the earliest. Okay, thank you, thank Professor Tesla. Very excellent answer. Yeah. So next questions. Okay, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Hans from Ho Chi Minh City University of Technologies and uh, VNU uh, SAM. I got actually uh, three questions, but this time is not uh, allowed, so I will ask two questions. The first one is about the strategic uh, one, maybe for the whole panel, and you can discuss between and uh, give people here some information. The second one, particularly for uh, Thomas, actually uh, about ACMS. Uh, the first one, he says you got a new uh, VG Geos Master Plan this year, and learning from, you know, for the last 12 years, we've got a lot of uh, success and some limitation. So my question is, how can you anticipate, can you give us some risk that could be affected to your new master plan goal for the next 10 years? And that is the first one. Uh, that, that's good, you know, this is a very wide, wide range question that can come to uh, all stakeholders here. So from sorry, can, can you concentrate yeah. on your question? Yes. The, uh, the second question is about ACMS. This is quite interesting. That's why uh, you feel this is very, very short time. And even the business process or business requirements not uh, settled down. So this is my question is, when the business requirement change in the future, how can you deal, how ACMS, ACMS, your system deal with the change, you know, dynamically frequent change in the future? Definitely it will happen. 
Thank you very much. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, so for the first, with the master plan, you see, over the last three years, every year we had some changes in the master plan and submitted it to the new university council. But at the same time, reality hit us. So we got new legal framework in the higher education law. We got the trilateral agreement now. We got some other issues in the past. So whenever we adopt it to the actual situation and we submit it, then we agree with the University Council we should revise it once again and hope, hoping that we have a stable, stable situation next year. So uh, I'm really keen in, in five weeks, six weeks, we will have the next University Council meeting, what we decide on the master plan of VGU. But to be honest, if the University Council will approve it now, as I mentioned in my presentation, next year we will have a new charter. We will have a new uh, uh, um, sustainable financial regime. Yeah. We will have uh, a new structuring of the, the steering committee and the university council and many other changes. So I am quite sure we will revise this master plan at least yeah. once yeah. again after we have the new charter because yeah. then I think we reach from the legal framework a more stable situation so that we really can make a sustainable plan, uh, a master plan, and we will keep the targets even if they are very high ranking, but it, we need to keep them. It's our target to become a very highly ranked research university. And we will reach this. The, the major basis for this is the unity of research and teaching. So our lecturers always have the most recent knowledge in their field and can transfer it to the students. And our students from the first semester will already be involved in research. So I think we can reach this. But uh, to coming to the ICMS, um, we did very carefully the analysis of the business processes. And uh, we will need maybe in two or three years some revision of the business processes because we can optimize it. There will be new releases of the software system. But the good thing with uh, standard software is that you can easily adapt it to new business processes and sometimes even better with a new release the software supplier can provide you a new process you didn't even think about in the past that can optimize your business process so this is a continuous process in every company and it will be on the long term in every university that you will have to revise and to adapt the system but not in changing the software code but in changing the customizing of the software. So this is not as expensive as you might think uh, from the beginning. Okay, thank, thank you, Professor Ben. I would uh, like to invite Professor Teisler, who are the father of Master, master Plan 4, to, to talk a little bit about risk and master plans. Okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Wien. Yes, I uh, already Dr. Benz mentioned it. You see, traditionally we believe that we make one master plan with details for the next five years, and then this plan is valid for five years, and after five years we try to measure what was the outcome and what do, should we do in the next five years. And Dr. Benz correctly pointed out this we have not done. We have revised the master plan every year. Yeah, so we looked five years uh, yeah, after, after one year, we looked two years number two to six. After two years, we looked at two years three to, to seven. And I, I think this was needed because we had, with such a dynamic change of conditions, yeah, sometimes of external new regulations, sometimes not. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, complicated negotiations between the different actors. The conditions for planning, master planning, change practically every year. 
And uh, that's why we have put more energy into master planning than if if we could just trust, yeah, of a plan five years ago. So, but I I thought this was okay. I never felt we made a mistake in the past, but we have to catch up with the dynamic of uh, conditions and adjust it again. And that's why I, I also believe, as Dr. Benzer said, probably for the next years we will go on submitting every year the, uh, the University Council a re adapted. So that is Rick. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Can you reason? <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated, but I think it's it's worthwhile to get a good good negotiation. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I would like to say something. Even though VGU, I'm not part of the VGU, uh, but uh, VGU or New Model University is part of the World Bank engagement with the government. Um, and we strongly believe that there's no risk uh, to the master plan in a way that VGU is building his governance structure and mechanism that allows a collective of, um, uh, of knowledge in making the decisions, you know, from the faculty to the Senate and the University Council. So the mechanism for decision making is there. The capacity of the university is being built, as you heard from Professor Ben um, earlier uh, this afternoon. Um, basically, everyone is learning to do it, but everyone is now accepting their new responsibility and accountability to be part of the decision making. And finally, the consultation, uh, you know, external consultation is the continuous um, process for the VGU. So, hands on my heart, I'm very, um, I'm very proud and very confident that university has already uh, in the right track to build a system to have the master plan keep updating um, as regular and as and when it's needed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yu. So, we may have several more questions before we close this section. So, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Stefan Hasebergen, DAD office in Hanoi. I have a question regarding autonomy and finances, and this is uh, directed, addressed to you from the moment. Um, VGU uh, is supposed to be and will be a new model university, a model for Vietnamese universities. However, um, there is a basic funding, and I'm not talking about the World Bank loan, because this is for the investment on a green field. I'm talking about annual running costs of each university. And as far as I'm concerned, as I learned it from different universities, the more autonomous a university is, the lower is the basic funding. And completely autonomous universities do not get any state funding, basic funding anymore, while VGU still gets basic funding. So the question is, how can VGU be a model for Vietnamese universities as an autonomous university being funded, being basically funded by the state while other universities in Vietnam are not? Because I think this is a major challenge for Vietnamese university acting autonomously and not being funded. There are a few universities who are dealing with this. But especially in the provinces, it is very difficult for them. Okay, thank you. Professor Thay, happy business. I would like to answer this question in Vietnamese, please. Thì câu hỏi này nó liên quan đến tự chủ, tự chủ đại học và đặc biệt là tự chủ về tài chính. Thực ra tự chủ về đại học thì chúng ta hay nghĩ đến tự chủ tài chính, nhưng thực ra tự chủ về đại học là rất nhiều mảng liên quan đến hoạt động của một trường đại học. Mà cái quan trọng nhất mà tôi nghĩ là là uh, luật uh, giáo dục đại học sửa đổi uh, uh, tức là luật 34 mà đã được ban hành uh, năm 2018 vừa qua ấy, nhấn mạnh nhất chính là cái quyền tự chủ về học thuật.
các thầy cô, các hội đồng từ hội đồng khoa, hội đồng khoa học và đào tạo của nhà trường, hội đồng trường đều tham gia vào cái quá trình ra cái quyết định và đặc biệt là phải tự do về học thuật. Vụ giáo, vụ giáo dục đại học của chúng tôi là phụ trách đúng cái mảng đào tạo tuyển sinh. Đấy chính là cái mà chúng tôi quan tâm bậc nhất. Tất nhiên về mặt tài chính thì chúng ta thấy rằng là cái nguồn lực của nhà nước không thể nào đầu tư cho tất cả các trường đại học công giống như trường Việt Đức, Việt Pháp hay Việt Nhật được. À, cái đó là một cái gọi là impossible, đúng không ạ? Chúng ta thấy là nó, nó không khả thi. À, cái tự chủ tài chính của chúng ta ở đây à, như ông à, có nói đến ấy, là cái việc à, nhà nước sẽ giảm dần hoặc là không cấp cái chi thường xuyên, đấy, chúng ta gọi là chi thường xuyên. À, còn những cái mảng đầu tư lớn về giáo dục đại học chắc chắn nhà nước vẫn phải ưu tiên à, đầu tư vào những cái trường đại học có tiềm năng vào những ngành đào tạo mũi nhọn, tiên phong và đấy chắc chắn là ưu tiên của giáo dục đại học, à, ưu tiên của chính phủ, của ngân, dùng ngân sách chứ không phải là là việc tự chủ chúng ta là cắt tài chính hoàn toàn. Cái, cái định nghĩa đấy tôi nghĩ là nó không phù hợp, không đúng. À, do đó việc tập trung nguồn lực và đi vào những cái dự án trọng điểm tập trung vào những ngành nghề mũi nhọn, tôi nghĩ là vào ngành nghề thì sẽ tốt hơn là vào một trường cụ thể bởi vì có những trường sẽ chỉ có một số ngành nghề thật sự tốt, thực sự mũi nhọn và sẽ trở thành gọi là world class được, phải không ạ? À, do đó việc đó không phải là, là, là cái vấn đề của việc cắt ngân sách. À, tự chủ về học thuật, tự chủ về tổ chức, về nhân sự và các cái hoạt động khác. Như vậy là nói đến tự chủ đại học chúng ta phải hiểu tất cả các khía cạnh như vậy. Thế thì đối với trường đại học Việt Đức rõ ràng là một cái mô hình quản trị à, học hỏi rất nhiều từ mô hình của Đức và cũng là một trong những cái bài học kinh nghiệm rất tốt để chúng tôi đã sửa đổi cái luật giáo dục đại học năm 2018 vừa qua. Và cái mô hình quản trị đó chúng ta thấy là cái tự do về học thuật của họ được đưa lên đỉnh cao. Và cái, cái tính đa dạng hóa trong cái mô hình quản trị đại học của Đức ở rất nhiều mức độ khác nhau. Đấy, chúng ta không nói về tài chính là chủ yếu đâu ạ, mà đấy chính là tự do về học thuật. Đấy. Và chúng ta thấy rằng là vai trò của bang Hessen trong trong việc đầu tư cho cho trường Việt Đức nó rất là lớn. Và với những cái đối tác như vậy thì chúng ta cũng có những cái vốn đối ứng từ phía chính phủ Việt Nam để có thể đưa cái mô hình đấy thực sự trở thành cái mô hình hàng đầu tiên phong ở Việt Nam. Và chúng ta muốn rằng là mong mỏi rằng là với những cái đầu tư sâu như thế thì ba cái trường đại học xuất sắc theo mô hình xuất sắc của chúng ta sẽ dần dần có được cái tiếng nói trên trường quốc tế và cũng là một cái động lực để hệ thống giáo dục đại học Việt Nam vươn lên. Nhưng tôi xin nhấn mạnh là có mặt ở đây rất nhiều các nhà đầu tư Uh, các cái trường đại học ngoài công lập mà tôi muốn nhấn mạnh vai trò của các trường đại học ngoài công lập vô cùng quan trọng uh, các anh các chị chính là cái động lực tiếp theo của giáo dục đại học Việt Nam uh, nếu không có cái sự chung tay góp sức từ phía các anh thì cái mảng đại học công không thể nào cứ uh, đi mãi theo một cái lối mòn như vậy các anh chị cũng chính là cái động lực để cái khối công thay đổi uh, để phát triển mạnh mẽ và linh hoạt hơn À, và tôi nghĩ rằng là cả hai khối à, đại học công và hội đại học ngoài công lập của chúng ta sẽ có rất nhiều cơ hội để cùng cộng tác với nhau, cùng tạo ra chúng ta có thể tạm gọi là uh, đại học chia sẻ, cái mô hình đại học chia sẻ dần dần sẽ hướng tới những cái mô hình từ cyber university, smart university, sharing university đấy là những cái thứ mà chúng ta sẽ hướng đến trong tương lai. Vâng, xin cảm ơn tất cả. Okay, thank you. So I let's say we are closing to the <cười> The end of the day. So I think I just one more question, and then we will close this section. Because I, I know you are on tires, and we have to, to to leave something for discussing during our gala dinner. Please. Yes, I would like to introduce myself. My, my name is Nguyễn Hải Đăng from the. Vietnam France University, you know the USTH, uh, one of the three uh, uh, USD to this model, Vietnam France University. So actually, uh, I'm interested in the uh, governance model of the uh, Vietnam uh, Germany U uh, University. Actually, um, uh, we have a Senate too in the uh, Vietnam France University system. Uh, but now, in, uh, from the uh, intergovernmental agreement between the two Uh, government Vietnam and France uh, signed in 2018 uh, uh, in uh, December. So uh, there's no more Senate. Senate. So um, <laughs> so I, I was curious about the role of Senate in uh, Vietnam German University. Um, what's the real role in the government activi uh, governance activities of the VGO 
uh, VGU, and also uh, can you justify or determine uh, how effective it is? And then uh, I also in interest in what's the interaction between the Senate and uh, the CU, uh, University Council, uh, and the uh, President Board. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so the academic senate decides on all academic questions. So new uh, new study programs, uh, organizational changes within the faculties, or um, and uh, regulations like uh, study regulations, uh, PhD uh, regulations, and so on and so on. All these regulations are finally decided by the uh, academic senate of the university, not by the presidential board. Yeah? If you ask about the efficiency, um, you could make it faster and maybe more efficient if you have one person in the hierarchy who could uh, decide. But as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, everybody is contributing out of the academic field to these regulations and to these decisions. So uh, you have a much broader support and you have the collective knowledge of the whole university. You see, as, uh, uh, as mentioned before, all our lecturers are ho holding a PhD. They did their PhD in foreign countries outside of, of Vietnam. So they, they did it in Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, Europe and uh, the US and Canada. So they bring experience from all this university, and this is much more than only adding one by one, because the combination of this knowledge can, can bring us much further, especially in the Vietnamese environment, because they have both. They have the knowledge of their university where they did their PhD, and they have the knowledge of the universities in Vietnam where they did their bachelors and maybe their masters. So we believe that this decision-making body may be a bit slower than a strictly hierarchical, but on the long term, much more sustainable and creating a much, more, um, uh, a, a much better uh, support and accountability and responsibility to everyone. Okay, so thank you. So you, you want to ask some more, Professor Teisler? Yeah, yes, you are welcome. Briefly, just briefly, I wanted to say uh, you have heard very much in detail how important, let's say, also a strong role of the academics and their knowledge is. You heard it by Dr. Benz and by Dr. Erdmann. And this has been, this is now recently be strengthened in because it, in the past there were so few professors but now there's a senate and now there is a more will be a more active interplay uh, between the senate with the university president and with the VGU university council than in the past so it's a new phase of an experiment i want to tell you that um, I, I am doing research on higher education and look at governance and in many of universities in many countries in the world. I believe in the long run there still will be a certain conflict in the Vietnamese German university because the external stakeholders and the governments in, in the university council will play a stronger role also in the future than just any average university in Germany or any average university in Vietnam. So we, we will have more heated discussion, but I think this is productive. The task, I, my understanding, the task of the Vietnamese German university is to embark in some ideas of innovation which you do not get automatically by academic ideas and which you do not get automatically by the market if you say autonomy is just on self-financing. So we need a discussion on, let's say, innovation, which uh, surprising innovation, I would call it, surprising innovation. And there, there, yeah, I think all people are uh, called, you see, upon to be 
patient, a little patient with these other and different views and try to get a, a constructive compromise. So I, I expect there will be tensions in the future, but as long as the spirit, you see, of saying we will be different from others, of having more creative innovations than others, they, this might be a basis for readiness for compromises. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for all very excellent and also challenging questions from our participants. Thank you for all panelists for your excellent answer and your contributions, successfulness of our <laughs> section today. Uh, I just uh, would like to invite you for a group photo because that would help us to recognize each other in the long future. Thank you. Please. We don't have to go to the group photo, do we? <laughs>